Maria Teresa of Bourbon Naples was born in Naples as the eldest daughter of King Ferdinand IV and Queen Maria Carolina. Raised in a deeply Catholic and politically active court, she was destined for a dynastic union. At 16, she married her double cousin, the future Emperor Francis II. Maria Theresa became Empress of the Holy Roman Empire during a time when the empire was crumbling under revolutions and Napoleon's rise. She cared little for power or fashion. Her mission was motherhood. She bore 12 children and was seen as a model of humility, piety, and duty. Francis II adored her, and after her death, he struggled to find her equal. Her glory lies not in a crown, but in the quiet heroism of her life, contemporaries wrote. Though other Maria Theresas are more famous, to the Habsburgs, she remained the image of familial virtue. Ebedi al-Wahid ibn Masud ibn Muhammad Enan was born in the Saudi Sultanate of Morocco. A courtier and experienced diplomat, he rose through the ranks under Sultan Ahmad al-Mansur. In the year 1600, he was appointed as Morocco's ambassador to the court of Queen Elizabeth I of England. The arrival of the Moorish ambassador in London caused a stir. His ornate clothes, beard, and solemn gaze inspired English artists and may have served as a model for Othello. His mission was to forge an alliance between Morocco and England against Spain. Speaking several languages and being a skilled diplomat, he was warmly received by the Queen, but the alliance was never consummated. His story is a reminder of the complex and surprising connections between the Islamic and European worlds during the Renaissance. Marie Josephine of Savoy was born in Turin into the Royal House of Savoy, daughter of Victor Amadeus III of Sardinia and Maria Antonia of Spain. She was raised in a strict yet refined court atmosphere. From a young age, she was groomed for dynastic marriage and betrothed to the future Louis XVIII of France. Despite her title, Marie Josephine lived in the shadow of her dazzling sister-in-law, Marie Antoinette. Her marriage to the Count of Provence, the future Louis XVIII, was childless and distant. She was unpopular at court and suffered from gossip and isolation. After the revolution, she lived in exile, withdrawn from public life. I was a queen without a kingdom, a wife without a husband, she once said. Her story reflects the fragility of a woman's role at court. Johann Joachim Quantz was born in Oberschieden in the electorate of Hanover. From a young age, he studied various instruments, eventually devoting himself to the flute and composition. After travels across Europe and studies in Italy and France, he gained fame as a virtuoso and teacher, especially admired in royal courts. A composer of the Enlightenment, Quantz became the personal tutor of Frederick the Great and wrote over 300 flute concertos. His treatise on flute playing became a key reference for musicians of the time. He did not seek fame on stage, but earned it through genius and self-discipline. I write for the mind, not just for the ear. Quance's music is marked by purity of form and clarity. It seems to extend the sound of the age of reason. Arcangela Terabati was born in Venice into a well-off family. Against her will, she was placed in a convent at an early age, a fate shared by many daughters in noble households. There, she turned to literature, becoming a rare female voice of protest. Educated and eloquent, she used her writing to challenge patriarchal norms and clerical oppression. Arcangela was one of the first Italian feminists. Her pen rose against convent violence and inequality. In the inferno of women, she called forced monasticism a social execution. Her writings were banned and spread in secret, but beyond the cloister, her voice was awaited. My body is confined, but my mind is free. Even locked in a cell, she remained a voice of the era, silenced neither by the church nor by time. Jacob Jordans was born in Antwerp into a prosperous merchant family. 
He studied under Adam van Noort and never left his native city. Though not a traveler, he absorbed the grandeur of Rubens and soon became his closest follower. Jordaens later inherited many of Rubens' commissions and clients, securing his place among the Flemish masters. Jordaens painted exuberant scenes with merry peasants, myths, and allegories, with a liveliness and irony that set him apart from the solemn Rubens. He was a master of light and domestic realism, filling his canvases with energy and life. Even when working for kings, he preserved his free spirit. I paint the world as I see it, loud, warm, and full of wine and laughter. Elizabeth Charlotte of the Palatinate was born in Heidelberg into the noble house of Wittelsbach. Raised in a Protestant court, she was educated with unusual rigor for a girl of her rank. Her marriage to Felipe, Duke of Orleans, and brother of Louis XIV, brought her to Versailles, where she would become a sharp-eyed chronicler of court life. Despite the Catholic court, the Duchess of Orleans kept her common sense, frankness, and German stubbornness. Her letters are a unique source on life at Versailles, filled with gossip, irony, and sharp judgment. She despised intrigues, but observed them with a keen pen. I take no part in this circus, but I describe it better than anyone. Christian II of Denmark was born into the Oldenburg dynasty and became king of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Raised in a court shaped by Renaissance ideals, he sought to centralize power and reduce noble influence. His reign began with reformist ambitions and a desire to strengthen royal authority across the Kalmar Union. His attempt to hold power in Sweden led to a bloody event the Stockholm bloodbath, after which Christian lost his throne and was exiled. Spending nearly 30 years in captivity, he remained a symbol of a tragic reformist king. I wanted justice and became a prisoner of my own dream, he said in old age.